I said, empty your mind. Be formless, shapeless, like water. It's about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. Join movement expert Aaron Alexander as he dives into the minds of the foremost innovative healthcare thinkers and movement masters on their approach to optimal health and wellness. Align Podcast. Welcome back to the Line Podcast. My name is Aaron Alexander. In today's gorgeous episode, got to have Dr. David Perlmutter on the program for the second time. Uh, he is releasing his revised edition of Grain Brain coming out tomorrow, December 17th. And uh, so we wanted to get him back on to discuss the book and all sorts of other different really interesting wormholes. Um, so really great conversation. Uh, Dr. Perlmutter is a four times New York Times, four times New York Times, four time? That's a strange thing to say. Uh, he's had four books that made it on the New York Times bestselling list. He is a board certified neurologist and he is a super nice guy. He's like one of the most grounded humans I think that uh, I've gotten to come in contact with via this podcast. So really grateful to get to share some time with him and uh, I know you guys are going to love this conversation. Thank you so much for tuning into the website, aligntherapy.com, A-L-I-G-N therapy.com. On there, you can start the five-day movement challenge. Start integrating more effective movement into your day-to-day life. So valuable. Every movement can become an opportunity if you know what the heck you're doing in there, that body of yours. Thank you so much uh, for supporting Faraday's. Grab yourself a pair of underoos from those guys. They are made of bamboo and spandex and stretchy good stuff. And then they got this crotch, uh, silver lined crotch territory, silver thread that uh, it's like a pouch around your, your nuts if you're a fella. And uh, that stuff is shown to help block with EMF, electromagnetic frequencies being emitted by your cell phone and computer and all those, all those things, phone towers and stuff. We don't need it. Um, so you can grab those guys, faradays.co. Use the line code for 10% off of your purchase. Faradays is F-A-R-A-D-A-Y-S.co. Align, A-L-I-G-N. All right, here we go. This was recorded at the Hilton in Beverly Hills uh, just like literally a few days ago. So we wanted to get it out because the screen brain is out or it's coming out. All right, here we go. Back to the show. Enjoy. Pow. Align podcast. What did you have for breakfast, just for sound sound purposes? Uh, I had two glazed donuts. Oh, good. A croissant. <laughs> oh, good. And a power shake. <laughs> yeah. Low carb power shake. That's retro, man. You're taking it back. Heck yeah. So, <laughs> one of the things that I've noticed with you that I f- I find really valuable is um, you're like playful. You seem to like enjoy life, and then something that I notice with a lot of the people in the, in the health sphere in general is it's like we almost get overly saturated in the facts and the science and the, and the books and all that. And we forget about actually just like enjoying life. And I feel like that's where a lot of the medicine is, you know? So is that something that's, that's oh, relevant I, to I you? think you're exactly right. I think, uh, that <clears throat> if you're not, if you're taking it all too seriously, that makes everything a little bit more stressful, which is exactly what you don't want to do. Yeah. So what a great life to be grateful for and, uh, you know, express that every day. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of stuff are you doing with your time that you're enjoying? What brings joy in your life? My work, for one. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I've recognized my limited skill set in this world and I have, I believe, exploited it. And, uh, you know, it is uh, a sense of giving back, of actually acting on gratitude John Kennedy, interestingly, said that, um, you know, demonstrating or recognizing gratitude is one thing, but in terms of appreciation, it's not the uttering of the words of appreciation, it's acting on those words and letting those words guide you. Hmm. So it's, you know, there's there's a lot to be said about demonstrating uh, your gratitude in your acts. And interestingly, I I mentioned this to somebody else earlier this morning, that we tend to believe that our thoughts control our actions. But when you understand neuroplasticity, how the brain can rewire itself based upon your choices, to a significant degree, our actions determine our thoughts. What we choose to do will ultimately change our brains and will change how our brain functions and our outlook. Mm. So if you act 
compassionately towards others, you rewire your brain to be a conduit for compassion and empathy. Hmm. What are basic steps that you actively utilize in your life that kind of aggregate up? I think it's just, it's like a momentum game. <laughs> you know, we have a little drop and then it's like, okay, well that gets covered up by the momentum of the rest of our lives. As we start to gain momentum through these acts, it starts to like become who we are. It's exactly right. It's a very good point because that is the fundamental of um, neuroplasticity as originally right. described in the 1940s by Dr. Donald Hebb. That is, uh, neurons that fire together will ultimately wire together, meaning the more you do something, and there's no muscle memory, it's obviously brain related when you're learning how to play tennis or whatever it may be. Yeah. So the more you practice your golf stroke, the more indelible that becomes in your brain, the, the harder it is wired in. And it's the same thing with respect to um, doing uh, activities that are engaged in uh, that are thoughtful, that are paying attention to the long-term consequences, how they're going to affect other people uh, in uh, opposition to the notion of acting impulsively and not giving consideration to whatever action that might be. That wires you into the more primitive part of the brain, the amygdala or fear center, uh, in contrast to connecting to the prefrontal cortex, the front part of the brain that really is our gift as humans. You know, what do we have? We have two things going for us, the opposable thumb and the prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal cortex lets us, lets us plan for tomorrow. It lets us store food for uh, tomorrow when we are hunter-gatherers. It lets us recognize that our actions today are having an impact on the planet's climate tomorrow as well. In contrast to simply acting for ourselves uh, narcissistically and uh, impulsively where we just want to get the most out of what we can today and uh, pay no attention to, to its consequences. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty, it's like paradoxical. It seems like the more you focus on yourself, you know, the, the lonelier you become and the more depressed you become. But originally the intention was to like help yourself but then you almost get yourself stuck with it. There's like the, the, the longest study running study was a study out of Harvard is like over 80 years old. You might be familiar with it. And they started studying people from, you know, since they were babies all the way to now they're like over 80 and they found the most valuable component to the, the, the people that ended up being the healthiest was community. You know, so all the other stuff, smoking and diet and everything, like, I think it's all important, but the people that didn't feel like they were really had a support group, say the word connected, connected. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, I was asked uh, actually a question about that earlier today. And uh, the question was, what do you think is the w most important pe thing that people can do or, or have in their lives to be healthy? And I said, recognize the importance of connectedness. Hmm. And by that, I mean the connections we have to our genome, our microbiome, right. uh, our family, our neighbors, uh, other people in our community our country, between countries, and our connection to the planet. Because modern life is very disconnecting. In fact, most of the ills of modern life represent disconnection, many of which are manifestations of our disconnection in terms of how we signal our genome, how our food choices, our lack of sleep, our stress, sends signals to our genome that are interpreted in such a way as to amplify things like the production of inflammatory chemicals to reduce the production of endogenous antioxidants that compromise our ability to detoxify, that affect our gut bacteria. So it's really reconnecting to the signaling pathways that have been honed for 2 to 2.5 million years that we've suddenly, just in the blink of an eye, become detached from, and we're suffering the consequences for that. I mean, a week ago, it was announced that for the first time in America, lifespan of women and men is now declining as a manifestation, not of a sudden gene change, but of a change in our lifestyle choices. Hmm. You feel as though we can gain relationship with ourselves through our diet, I would imagine? Diet is one part of it. I mean, Aaron, you are very much tuned in. As you tell me, you spend time on the roof because you want to get in the sun. You spend a lot of time touching the ground or walking barefoot as you are right now. Uh, and that is a sense uh, that you need to reconnect. 
Yeah. Uh, there's no question there's signaling coming from the, the Earth as it oscillates. There's no question that sunlight is important for circadian rhythm, for vitamin D production, etc. cetera. Uh, but, you know, those are just two very mild uh, examples of, of reconnecting actions that you've taken. Yeah. But food being very, very important. I mean, the, uh, we have a, and there's a thing in America today bear with me, called a health food store. Perhaps you've heard the term. Mm. And a health food store is a place where you can actually go and buy food that might have something to do with your health. And that begs the question, then what's the rest of this stuff that the other grocery stores are selling right. if that's not a health food store? We have to recognize that our food is far more than macronutrients, that our food is information. It's instructing our physiology. It's changing our diet. The expression of our DNA. That's a very heady concept. But when you get that, uh, then you can begin to understand why certain choices might be appropriate if you're looking to maintain health. Yeah. Do you know Chris Ryan? Dr. Chris Ryan wrote Sex at Dawn. He's, um, oh, he's I, I got to like share stuff with you. He's very interesting. I was doing a thing with him yesterday. He spent like 20 years in Spain. And he mentioned to me that they have, this is, I heard this from Chris yesterday. I, don't, I haven't like read it anywhere, but I believe they have the longest lifespan or they have like, it's, it's, I believe that's what it is. I got to like fact check it. But one of the things that, that was interesting about that is the people out there, they smoke and they drink alcohol and they do tapas midday, but they have this community connection throughout the day, you know? And so I just, I'm really curious of, of, like the power of our, our thoughts, how that impacts food and the power of placebo and the power of intention that we put in the food. Like I hear things like the feeding window. I feel like words like that sometimes almost, it feels like it sterilizes like the, the joy of, of eating. Mm. Well, it, I think for me, it gets back to two very important concepts that we've now covered. They are connection and gratitude. Yeah. So there's so much that seems to be going on during our meals. Uh, you know, people have their dinner watching the evening news, which would be about the worst uh, combination you can imagine. Uh, Deepak Chopra once said that um, if you're a smoker and you don't think that's a good idea, don't quit. But the next time you have a cigarette, s go outside, sit down and smoke that cigarette mindfully, <laughs> as opposed to having that cigarette while you're typing on the computer, while you're doing on the phone, like a right. busy executive, whatever it is that you do, where you're disconnected from that experience. And he said, if you want to quit, that if you connect to it and really experience it fully uh, it, and recognize it for what it is, that, that may actually be helpful. So I think uh, as it relates to food, uh, that's a moment of of gratitude that we, yeah. uh, you know, it's why fasting, I think is another reason fasting is so right. important because when you finally do have that meal where you break the fast, i.e. break fast as it were, then you have that ability to experience, uh, that gratitude that you do have, uh, food and that, uh, you're able to appreciate, uh, that moment and, uh, that enters into, the, the cascade of chemicals passing through your body at that moment that can then be amplified by the hopefully nutritious aspects of the food that you're consuming. Yeah. What are some of the, the, the apparent low hanging fruit that you see missing in Western culture, like easy accessible stuff, dietary choices or movement related to help ameliorate the, the health situation? I'd say the biggest thing uh, are the, uh, incredibly massive shifts in, uh, in diet that have occurred in terms of the just the amount of A, sugar, but B, chemicals that, that people right. are just exposed to. I had, uh, oddly enough, breakfast uh, here where you and I are right now this morning. And uh, there was a woman uh, sitting next to me, uh, two women actually. And so the, the woman that was facing me, uh, she orders... Um, her coffee and into her coffee she is putting uh, she or orders her coffee with um, skim milk then into her coffee she's putting these pink packets of sweetener because they're not sugar right, right? and I was so close to saying something <laughs> but you got to realize that, you know ostensibly the reason people are using artificial sweeteners is so they want to avoid the dreaded sugar good right. idea but not really because 
what our modern culture has done is created these products with the narrative surrounding them that's so perverse only to sell product that doesn't have your health in mind. Yeah. This particular sweetener, saccharin, is known to dramatically change the, the microbiome, the gut bacteria, to uh, actually dramatically increase weight gain and augment the risk for type 2 diabetes as well. And I really, I wanted so much to say something, but I didn't, you know, I, you don't want to interrupt somebody's breakfast. And she was all dialed in on what she thought this the right thing to do. And you, with all due respect, she was significantly overweight. And there's so many people that way who are just getting the wrong messaging and buying into this idea that this is the right thing to do when, hey, full fat milk would have been a better choice, in my opinion. And just have your coffee without added sweetener and yeah. get used to that that taste. So, uh, but you know, you you just keep pushing forward. You write the books, you give the lectures, and do these podcasts, and yeah. and hopefully, you know, it, the messaging gets out. But I think that's a very important part of the low hanging fruit. And the other part of the low hanging fruit is the sudden recognition, the epiphany that people can get when they realize how their brains have been hacked, how their <laughs> brains daily are being hacked. Uh, wherever they are, whether it's out in public, uh, on your computers, looking at social media, yeah. how you and your eyeballs are of value to somebody else and how everything has been manipulated to target you and your desires so that you will click. And as such, you know, your, your brain is no longer yours. And I think it's very powerful when people at least get that conception on board because, you know, half of changing uh, uh, destiny is recognizing where you are currently. And being aware of the, those influences, I think, is huge. Yeah. Yeah, the trance that we're in is really interesting with staring into the screen. Like, if you were to, if you didn't realize that we're doing important things, like looking at cat videos on Instagram, or, you know, you knew what the person was doing, you would, I would think you would just think that people are depressed. And if you look around and you see people hunching over and staring at this thing, and their eyeballs aren't moving, they're completely entranced by this thing, as they're in a hunched over, you know, d seemingly depressed position, you know, and then, our physiology responds to that. And there's studies that show that it like increases stress hormones and decreases testosterone Without, levels. Yeah. And it is the, the most incredible misnomer of all to call it social media. It is the most anti-social practice you can imagine. Mm. It distances you from people. It doesn't connect you to other people. There's no connection like you and I are connecting right now. That is, when you're doing one thing, you're not doing something else. When you're on Instagram or Facebook day in and day out, you're not connecting with other people. Mm. There's so much going on between you and me right now. Yeah. We are actually sharing bacteria. We are sharing the bacteria that we carry, and that is genetic material. So I will forever influence you, and you will forever influence me at a genetic level from our encounter at this time. Mm. That's not going to happen on the computer. And it's important that it does happen because you bring to my microbiome, not just in my gut, but on my skin throughout my body, and this is just one level of interaction, a higher level of diversity. And diversity begets resilience. So you are contributing to my health, and I appreciate that. <laughs> Likewise, man, I appreciate it. <laughs> Have you heard that um, children, that uh, mothers, when they're, they're attuning to their children, um, you'll see the same parts in the brain. It's almost like, like kind of like a mirror neurons type thing, but you see the same parts lighting up in synchronicity with that. Yes. And they're, uh, they're attuning to each other. That's something you, you can't do with the social media thing. And then those, those children end up being what more, you know, robust organisms, essentially they do better with yeah, stress so and such, you know, and we're writing a new book actually about this called brainwash. That'll be out in uh, January of 2020 being written with Austin Perlmutter, MD, who uh, uh, happens to be our son. <laughs> so what a great experience that's going, that is, has already been writing a book with your son. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. in so doing our research has really, uh, it was very eye-opening, and in fact, it didn't really coalesce until the very end of that experience when we finally were able to take a step back and recognize the powerful influences that are being uh, leveraged to captivate our minds. Mm. And that's what brainwash is all about. We're, we're going to wash the brain. We'll push the reset button. Tell people how to do it, how to distance themselves from that, how to reconnect to nature, how to spend time exposed to nature, no matter where you may be. You know, you might not live next to a national park, but you could put a plant in your in your kitchen 
There's things that you can do to reconnect yeah. uh, and reconnect to the right signals to your to your genome. Reconnect to your neighbor. What is your neighbor's name? How could you not know that? Well, it's time. <laughs> it's time to, to some degree, put down your defenses, recognize uh, that fear seems to be motivating your life. And beyond that, this sense that is uh, inculcated into our brains that we never measure up. We're not... Uh, Thin yeah. enough, rich enough, handsome enough, beautiful enough, uh, successful enough, whatever is the the parameter, we're never going to be fully measured up. And that's bombarded into our brains day in and day out in uh, connection to the click that will fix that. Mm. I can buy the car. I can buy the better looking glasses. I can go to this guy and get a, uh, my nose fixed, whatever it may be. But day in and day out, we are just being bombarded by signals telling us we're just not good enough. And yep. I, I think that the message here is for everybody that you are pretty darn good. Gosh, <laughs> you really are great. You are incredible, as a matter of fact. Ugh. Turn off the computer. Uh, don't spend so much. Don't spend eight hours of screen time a day and talk to people. Reconnect with people. And it's, it's as you mentioned, it's vitally important. In the so-called blue zones, that's certainly one parameter that's very important. Um, I'm very taken by the uh, fact that you can now buy blue zone foods, foods that are labeled blue zone in the grocery store. Like that is how you can connect. I saw an ad this morning sort of playing on that thing, theme saying, we, we are our clothes, meaning you can, whatever it is you want to be, that can be in your clothes, buy those clothes and off you go. You're all set. Mm. In other words, there's a, a click to satisfy your sense that you aren't who you are because you're not currently measuring up. You don't have worth. In a sense, you are your clothes because you're absorbing the chemicals and the dyes that come off of them all day. So you have something five million odd different pores in your body that are continually absorbing, including like breathing oxygen. Like your 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 whole organism is breathing. Your all of you is alive. So when you put something onto you, just like we're breathing each other, um, you're doing that with your clothing as well. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if there's any effect with like like um, like BDNF and some of these like cognitive markers with um, with restriction in clothing. Like if you're wearing restrictive pants or restrictive shoes or if you're not able to fully move your body. Well, uh, I think in the regard of not, not fully moving your body, on the other hand, it, uh, I mean, that might be an issue. But on the other hand, if it's uh, a bit off topic, but if it's so restrictive that it's stressful to you, then a low level of that stress might actually be a good thing for you. Mm. But, you know, it's interesting to bring up the notion of food, uh, rather of clothing and uh you know, some of the best brands out there that you think are really environmentally conscious that offer outdoor clothing yep. all across the board of these water resistant fabrics like Gore-Tex, for example, uh, are significant threats uh, that really uh, uh, give your body a significant exposure to certain types of chemicals like as found in Teflon, uh, originally mm. made by DuPont, that are really threatening. Mm. But they can't distance themselves from that because there's no other way, apparently, to make water resistance in a fabric that's mm. cost effective. On the second round with, with uh, Grain Brain, was there anything that stood out, that, that big changes for you in the revised edition? Well, in, so we wrote Grain Brain, published it five years ago, and uh, there's no doubt that it was very disruptive. Yeah. I mean, it take yourself back five years and here's a book that comes out and says you should eat more fat are you kidding me eat more fat and less carbs uh, except for fiber less certainly less sugar and gluten what the heck is gluten i never heard of it oh yes uh, i've heard of people that have celiac disease maybe is that the same thing so that's where we were five years ago yeah. it, it it's uh hard to put yourself back in that frame of mind now that we've learned so much uh and was there uh on the one hand, great acceptance globally, sure, 34 languages around the world, translations. On the one hand, on the other hand, was there pushback by people in uh, various parts of the nutrition world? You bet there was. Uh, there was a constant underlying theme that, or notion that if you don't have celiac disease, you shouldn't be gluten-free. There's no reason for it. There's, and we put forth the idea that there is something called non-celiac, gluten sensitivity and beyond that 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 can be why consuming gluten for some people can affect 
areas of the body that are not related to the gut, the joints, the skin, and dare I say, even the brain. And, uh, you know, that was done based upon, or statements were made based upon research that was coming out from a British researcher, Marios Hajivasalu. And uh, how uh, what's happened over the past five years has been just a uh, a really robust validation of of that mentality that we put forth, with even the Journal of the American Medical Association last year, absolutely confirming our contentions with reference to non celiac gluten sensitivity. A very big study or review article came out with you know re- the top researchers, gluten researchers from Harvard, uh, Dr. Alessio Fasano, for example, mm. saying as a matter of fact, it's very real that people can have sensitivity to gluten and has nothing at all to do with an autoimmune condition called celiac disease. So that was very validating. And you know as well as I do what has happened in the world of nutritional advice uh, with reference to lower lowering your sugar intake, lowering your carb intake, and eating more healthy fat. So uh, that has been, been powerful. There have been quite a few studies uh, that we quote in the new book that really talk about how dietary fat is good for your brain, how lowering your uh, insulin resistance by lowering your sugar consumption uh, is good for the brain, good for the body. So what this book did was and it was a pleasure to write this book this time around cool. not that it was tough last time it was actually enjoyable last time as well but it was so again uh, encouraging that we were able to revisit our ideas with this fresh data much more r- robust research saying yeah you would gotta get off the sugars and eat good fat the Predimed study that looked at the effects of the Mediterranean diet uh, on reducing risk for dementia, showing huge amplification in people who not only were eating the Mediterranean diet, but added in a liter per person per day, uh, per week of olive oil, pure fat, mm. and their risk was reduced another 40%. So um, it, that's what's uh, so exciting about, about the revision. I'm very excited about it. Yeah. Is our, the, the way that our body assimilates or breaks down things like gluten or sugar or fat. Is that like a, a static thing? Where like is your, how malleable is your, is your gut biome? Great question. And it's very malleable and we induce enzymes as needed. So our ability to break down fat declines if we're not eating fat over time, mm-hmm. but we will re in, uh, we will re uh, up our production of the digestive lipases, the enzymes that break down fat, with, uh, in short order once we begin consuming fat again. So we really are quite readily adaptable. And the microbiome changes in as little as three days based upon dietary changes. Mm-hmm. So we have that ability to really adapt. And uh, it's a powerful signaling mechanism that the changes that are induced in the microbiome were always a seasonal event in our Paleolithic history. That in the fall, changes, dramatic changes, we assume, took place in the gut microbe, uh, microbes uh, based upon the upcoming time of caloric ca- scarcity, which would be winter. And that uh, is a bit of an extrapolation from data that's been observed, for example, in bears. Uh, they have studied the gut bacteria in bears during their foraging times and during their hibernation. Uh, how they would get a stool specimen from a hibernating bear, I don't know. I mean, I know you could probably use a tranquilizer dart when there's a bear <laughs> eating the berries, but the other part of the story, who, who gets? But anyhow, they're dramatically different. It tells us that the microbiome, the gut bacteria, anticipate these changes in the season to prepare the body. In this case, loading the bear up with, dieti- with the body fat so he or she will survive through the winter. But how the microbiome has seasonality to it to accomplish these goals, but is triggered to make changes based upon the food influence. Suddenly, berries are being eaten, right. and it says to the, the bear's microbiome, we got to start packing on the fat because winter's coming. In addition, berries contain glucose, signals insulin. And we all say, well, insulin's important because it packs the sugar away, right? That's its function. Well, we don't want to lock into that. Insulin is a trophic hormone for brain cells in terms of keeping them healthy. But it's also fundamentally involved in protein and even in fat. It is a signal that winter is coming as such. It locks our fat in place and adds more to it. Mm. So it inhibits what we call lipolysis, the breakdown of fat, and becomes actually lipogenic 
turning on the metabolic pathway to make fat. Fat isn't made by dietary fat. Dietary fat tells you that uh, the calories are plenty. You don't need to store anymore because you've got plenty. Yeah. It seems like cycles are really important in our body. You know, the circadian rhythm. And I was looking at a thing recently where you could see the the, the levels of leptin and, and ghrelin, like hunger, hunger hormones right. and satiation hormones. They're actually not so much in relation to whether you're actually hungry or full, but actually more of a time-based thing. So they, they'll start to come and start to uh, be synchronized with the, your normal pattern of eating. Is there any... And I, I don't know if you've... Well, it's not just your normal pa- pa- pattern of eating, but it is also very much a circadian, uh, light, dark, melatonin-mediated uh, okay. event. So that people who have uh, poor sleep, uh, poor levels of restorative sleep... Uh, have issues, dramatic issues with respect to leptin and ghrelin and other hormones that ultimately lead to obesity. Hmm. So I can't control their hunger and uh, crave those very foods that are the worst for them, crave the simple carbohydrate foods. So uh, they're locked in. So, you know, oftentimes one of the first things you want to think about when you're dealing with somebody who is significantly overweight and can't seem to lose weight uh, is what's sleep like. So we know that it's a vicious cycle. The more weight you gain, the more likely you are to have sleep apnea, have interrupted sleep, being pulled out of the deeper levels of sleep so it's not really restorative. Uh, That has impacts in terms of the brain because then the brain doesn't uh, empty out its toxins through what's called the glymphatic system. Uh, and uh, these uh, individuals are uh, have higher levels of insulin resistance. So sleep interruption causes insulin resistance, which raises blood sugar, which causes you to gain weight, which interrupts your sleep. So mm-hmm. this is a merry-go-round that people get on, and you have to be super aggressive with these individuals and not just look at putting them on a low-carb diet and think that's going to, to help it. They may need... Uh, obviously a sleep study, they may need some sort of CPAP or other intervention to take care of that part of the story, change the diet, look at changing stress as well. Uh, there's a lot of things that have to be factored in. It's, it's never going to be, uh, one answer that helps people get through these issues. Yeah. You, of all the people that I have got to interview on here, which, um, now have released like 205 episodes, whenever this goes up, I don't know what it'll be, but, um, you're like, you seem to be one of the more, maybe the most balanced person with the, the clout and, and everything that you've achieved in, in, you know, in the world. I wonder, is there anything that stands out that you like struggle with? Oh, I struggle with a lot of things. Uh, I am, uh, you know, as an achiever, I think I, I, I can be critical of myself. Um, mm. and, um, but I do uh, generally adopt a position of recognizing that at the end of the day, it's the best I can do and that I'm not the best at everything. Uh, I suck at ping pong. I'll tell you <laughs> right now. That's, it's actually true. Good. Uh, my wife beats me. My son w- just uh, takes me to the cleaners. Uh, but, so I recognize it. And I think it's, co- it's coming to an understanding of counting your blessings. I mean, uh, everybody has their skill set. And I think it's really... Yeah. important that we uh, we really take advantage of those things that we can do uh, and recognize those things that we can't. So, uh, you know, there's, there's an old aphorism about God grant me strength to make things, basically make things happen when I can make a change and recognize the times that, that I cannot. So um, it's always a challenge because you want to do more. But um, I think uh, I, I am very appreciative as to where I am at this stage in my life. You know, I was like anyone else in my teenage years and, and younger and struggled for trying to understand what it's all about. And that and for certain, I have yet to fully figure out what it's all about. But I do know, you know, a couple of things that seem to work for me. And first is to be a good listener, is that the other person, uh, in, as is happening right now, uh, you looking at me, the other person has a lot to say, and you're going to learn from that person. I've always said my patients taught me a lot more than I think I imparted in, in them because they taught me wonderful <laughs> totally. life lessons. So that's been very important for me is to stop and listen. And um, I think that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the importance of compassion that uh, the Dalai Lama said that to be happy, practice compassion, uh, to make other people happy 
practice compassion. So just, I mean, that should be sort of a watchword. Mm. And um, my mission for myself is to do the very best I can to distance myself from responding from my amygdala and respond more from the prefrontal cortex. That's the mission in life. Now, there are times when you function from the amygdala and it's really effective. It's good. When they're, you're backing out of your driveway and uh, suddenly there's a, you see a kid on a bicycle coming across the back of your car and the camera or whatever it is, and you, you could say instinctually, but you suddenly hit the brake. You don't, you don't think about, well, you know, if I hit the brake, chances are it'll stop the car and I may not hit the, if, if that's what, if you're doing that exercise, that kid's already hit and on the, on the pavement. So you have this ability through the amygdala to act immediately without that whole filtration mechanism. But as far as the, the other important decisions of day to day, it should go through your prefrontal cortex, not sudden impulse generated actions i.e somebody says something you don't like and you immediately tweet something nasty right back that everybody gets <laughs> right. to read or that that's not utilizing this gift that we have this prefrontal cortex to think about well why did they say that maybe they have a point you know maybe what they were how they criticized me maybe i should think about that yeah it seems like the compassion piece i heard i think it's like joseph campbell said something about sigmund Freud. he said he's um, he's fishing out in the ocean while he's standing on top of a whale. And I feel like that's what a lot of us are doing. You know, we're, we're, we have all the, I have the, I have the perfect supplement and, and taking four pills a day. And, you know, meanwhile, you don't actually have, you haven't accessed that compassion for yourself or for, you know, or whatever the, whatever the whale might be, you know, do you have a sense of what the whale might be? <laughs> well, I think that the whale is in fact, um, the engrams that have been built up in us uh, since childhood, huh. which generally, uh, hopefully, should serve us, but for many people, those engrams are dysfunctional, and it it takes a lifetime to go through them and um, put them in place and contextualize them, if that ever even happens during a lifetime. Uh, you know, many people are still operating with direct reference to the their early life engrams, and some of those are painful, and they never get out of that mode. And yet through neuroplasticity, you can connect to other things. If you concentrate on goodness, for example, or relinquishing and letting those pathways wither on the vine and decide you're not going to cue uh, this when you see, uh, when, in, when an event brings back a memory and you may not be aware of it, you know, if you dig deep enough, you can, you can recognize that. And then that's half the battle. Once you recognize what is being triggered by the current experience that's making you feel bad, you can understand it and then try to redirect yeah. how you respond. Yeah, it seems like we're surrounded by so much static. It would be hard to actually have the spaciousness to look in and see what that initial imprint is in the first place. Yes. Like, what does my operating system look like? Well, you know, 99% of what goes on in the brain is in unconscious uh, areas. We don't know what goes on. But what's really important to understand is that Unconscious things going on within the brain are influencing the conscious. So all of those patterns, etc., that have been laid down over the years are moment to moment influencing our perceptions. These are, uh, this is software running in the background that is, uh, you know, affecting how ultimately what appears in the desktop that you actually are aware of. So mm. I think it's important to, to recognize that, but you do have access to that stuff through meditation, for example. There are various ways yeah. you can get at that stuff. Yeah. I think it's important to do that. Yeah. It seems like inflammation would be a fine, like, l literal and also metaphor for that static. Yes, and uh, literally, let's talk about that for just a moment. Did I say I said inflammation, right? Inflammation. Okay, yeah. I thought maybe I said meditation. Anyways, good. No, you might yeah. say inflammation. <laughs> yeah, right. So inflammation, <laughs> uh, which takes us back to you know diet and lifestyle, gluten, you name it. But the process of the upregulation of inflama inflammation in our bodies uh, directly compromises two things uh, beyond any area I think that we were expecting to go to. I'll. Uh, I'll say that. Uh, first, the connection from the amygdala to our prefrontal cortex, where we want to go, is mediated by a brain structure called the anterior cingulate. Inflammation compromises that functionality. We, it makes it harder to get to the prefrontal cortex. We're stuck in this 
reptilian response brain, mm -hmm. the more inflammation in our bodies. The higher levels of blood sugar translates to higher levels of inflammation keeps you in the reptilian brain. <laughs> the other thing that inflammation does is it antagonizes a specific serotonin receptor called the serotonin 1A receptor, which is really involved, for the most part, in mood regulation. So the, the more you and block the effectiveness of serotonin to do its job to make you happy or experience happiness uh, brought on by inflammation, the less obviously happy you're going to be. Hmm. So there's a lot more going on with inflammation as brought on by your dietary choices than the fact that you don't fit into your clothes anymore. <laughs> it's compromising your worldview. It's changing your microbiome. Yeah. They're changing your neurotransmitters. You're affecting how serotonin works. You're blocking your connection to the prefrontal cortex. You're in a bad way. You're going to see the world differently. You're going to act more impulsively, and you're going to support those people who act in the same way because that becomes the norm. Hmm. So we've got to reduce inflammation in general from at a societal level that allow us to regain our connection to our prefrontal cortexes and become more empathetic with reference to how we treat our neighbors. Yeah. I said the, the initial indications of Alzheimer's or the initial onset is something like 30 years before you actually see the signs pop up. Um, I heard you referencing something. Um, there's a study about inflammation. I think it was like a 24 year time span difference where they, they measured people's inflammation markers 24 years ago and then they come back again. And there was a one to one connection of the incidence of Alzheimer's based off of that, that inflammation. Well, actually the study was published in 2015 in the journal neurology and here's what it involved. Uh, it was a study of 1500 people and did in fact, uh, measure their inflammatory markers many years ago. They were different inflammatory markers than we have today. They were, dare I say, a little bit more primitive. Mm. Uh, fibrinogen levels, something called von Willebrand's factor, total white blood cell count, whatever. They're markers of inflammation. Then they followed these individuals for 24 years, and they determined that those individuals 24 years ago who had the highest levels of inflammation had the, the smallest brains and the worst memory. So it's important that people in their 20s and 30s recognize exactly what you just said, that their lifestyle, lifestyle choices right now today and at that point in their lives are hugely important in terms of determining their brain's destiny. Yeah. Let me tell you about another interesting study that was published just last year. There's a study that similarly did a measurement many, many years ago. And what they measured 36 years prior to, for, to looking at the data was one simple measurement. How big is your belly? End of story. Nobody's demented. How big is your belly? Average of 36 years later, they come back and look at the group. Those people who had the highest, what's called SAD, sagittal abdominal diameter, basically the size of their belly, had close to a four-fold increased risk for dementia. Hmm a disease for which there is no treatment. There is no treatment for Alzheimer's. So that's based on choices we make today. So we're saying, well, if you're in your 20s and your 30s, no, we need to pay attention to children and adolescents. We need to pay attention to mothers or pregnant women before they're even mothers because their choices influence the risk for obesity in their progeny. And if obesity is a risk factor for Alzheimer's, what a woman chooses to do during pregnancy increases or decreases the risk for their baby when they're 70. So it's very important. For example, we know there's a dramatic increased risk for obesity in children who are born by cesarean section. Be, being in a situation where they didn't pass through the birth canal and get inoculated with those microbes in the birth canal right. that, are the, that are the seeds, the uh, indoctrination, if you will, of their future microbiome. When you bypass that, it changes the set point of metabolism. It changes immune function. It amplifies inflammation. So we see things like dramatic increased risk for ADHD, for autism, for uh, celiac disease, for type 1 diabetes, which is autoimmune, for uh, obesity as an adolescent. So w when does it begin? Uh, and you know, we know that there are issues that are, tra that are carried on uh, between a, a mother and not just her children, but her grandchildren. And what we've now learned 
is that dads are not off the hook either. If you want to at least look at some rodent work, what a recent study demonstrated looking at laboratory rats was that if you expose laboratory rats to nicotine, the males, that the progeny uh, have some genetic changes and behavioral changes, and their progeny do as well. So we're really learning quite a bit about the notion of genetic transmission. You know, it's far more than, well, egg and sperm come together and you're half your mom and you're half your dad. It isn't like that. You're really, you know, demonstrating not just their gene expression or their gene sequencing, but you carry within you not just your parents' genes, but a recapitulation of what their environments were like when you were born. Mm. I was reading that um, dance is one of the, the, the best preventatives from Alzheimer's. Have you heard of, of yeah, this? Yeah, actually, Dr. John Rady wrote a book that uh, in his book uh, Spark uh, about basically you know programmed movement and how, how really important that is, and music too. Yeah, yeah. I, how important is that to you? Uh, well, the music part of it is extremely important. Yeah. So, uh, I play music every, I play guitar every day. Cool. Yeah. And even in in the summer when I'm living on a boat, I have a guitar. So, uh, it's real important. That's the spark. I think I see with you. (laughs) The music part? Something. Uh, It seems like you do like art or creativity or something like that. My, uh, the art I do, I've decided my daughter is so good at it that I just, I let her do it. She really is quite, and uh, for your She's an extension of you, so. It's Reisha Art, R-E-I-S-H-A Art dot com. Yeah, I can't wait to check it out. Oh, gosh. It's uh, really quite quite something. Yeah, so that's something, but that, do you feel like that's like a, a really important practice? I mean, practice is almost, almost like a silly word for it, but you feel like there's, there's a lot to that for people. Well, I, I, you know, the science, of course, supports that for sure. Yeah. Uh, but for me, it is, uh, I've often said that I don't know if I'm playing the guitar or it's playing me. Right. Because there are times when I will close my eyes and, and just let the, the music sort of an outgrowth of where my mind is. And then it starts to influence my mind. And, you know, it, you don't have, it's almost uh, like some sort of hallucinogen. So, yep. Not that I would know anything about that. I think that that's, I think that that's the whale. I think getting, like, giving yourself opportunities. Like, um, have you read uh, Stealing Fire, Stephen Kotler, Jamie yes. Hill's book? You know, so, like, moments of ecstasis. You know, so we're so, we're, we're operating by that prefrontal cortex, that 1%. It's like the little, like, child that kind of runs the show. Meanwhile, it's like the subconscious is, I think it knows how to heal your body. Oh, yes. You know, so I feel like those, those opportunities where you're out of the way of yourself and it feels like it's moving through me. I feel like, I think that's the whale. Well, here, here, here's the example <laughs> is getting out of the way and letting it happen. Uh, it's that first moment when you're on the two wheeler and it's happening and you say to yourself, oh my God, I'm doing it. Then that's when you crash, right? right. Or like when you're snow skiing and you're going down the hill. And, oh, well, oh my gosh, I'm actually doing it. Bang, down you go. Because then you start to get, uh, you start to, you know, intellectualize it and, and, and you get back to your recognition that you know you are not a snow skier. You are not able to ride a two wheeler. <laughs> and then as soon as that enters into the dialogue, down you go. So it's, uh, but then ultimately, what happens on the two wheeler? It's really a great metaphor because you do relinquish to this trust that those balance engrams and all those things that are operative are going to ta- are going to get you through and you ultimately nobody thinks about it when they ride their bike right right but you did yeah and that's you know, sort of the goal of life is to get to that place where there's this trust that it's just going to happen that you know decision making and how i comport myself will be dialed in at an appropriate level that's enlightenment yeah i mean that's what we all seek mm Thanks so much, man. Um, where should people go? Obviously, people should get the the revised edition of, of Grain Brain. So how different is this one compared to the last one? Uh, it's almost fully revised. Awesome. Uh, this is all just great new stuff that I think, you know, our community is really going to sink their teeth into quite literally uh, with, you know, really a, a good level of uh, validation that this is what we want to continue doing. Uh, here's where, how we've refined the target zones on laboratory studies and on diet. Um, so uh, it's it's very exciting. This already, what can I say, reached number one in uh, 
brain health on Amazon. Amazing. Well, five weeks before it was, it's been available. Yeah. It feels, I mean, this is like some of my own new age, whatever, what holding it, it feels like really powerful. Like the information in it, just the, the way that it's put together. Like it, to me, it feels important. Well, I, I hear what, exactly what you're saying and uh, that's what goes into it. And it's, when I finally get my books shipped to me after all the writing and the editing, et cetera, and I hold it in my hand, uh, it's part of me. Mm -hmm. And then the fact that I give that to the next person uh, and share my ideas right or wrong, uh, it's being able to, you know, to hopefully you know, transmit the information as I see it. Uh, again, right or wrong. But it's, and the fact that you or the next person would read that and because you want to hear, uh, you know, what my, uh, what I've cultivated in terms of the science, that's, it's very honoring when people read a book that you've created. Yeah. Um, so what's the, where's the best place to point people, I guess, get the book, but. Well, the book is Grain Brain Revised Edition, and uh, I'm uh, at drperlmutter.com of all places, drperlmutter.com. And that's a great place, I think, for people to start. We have a newsletter, comes out every week. Uh, which of course is free, and uh, Facebook is David Promoter MD, and I think Instagram is David Promoter David Promoter uh, with uh, uh, Twitter as well. <laughs> I don't uh, I do it, but I don't exactly remember how to log in. Yeah, you're findable. I mean, yeah, I'm findable. Yeah. I'm out there. <laughs> <laughs> and your site's got a lot of great information as well. You have yeah, like I, I am categories. really very proud about the site because we have. Uh, literally thousands of studies that we have cultivated in full PDF format. Um, and it's a totally searchable database that we have wow. in the learn section of drperlmutter.com. And under the learn tab, it's, mm. uh, this, it's science, called science. And once you get there, put in your search term, you could put in artificial, you'll get all the data on artificial sweeteners. You can put in statin, you can put in cholesterol, diabetes, you name it. And it's all there. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Thank you, man. All right. Good to see you. Appreciate I'll it. I'll see you Let's uh, go. in April, I guess. Yes. And right now in the cold, whatever, in for a cryo something. Anyway. Oh, yeah. I forgot about Thanks that. Thanks so much for doing it. Pow. Align Podcast. Thank you guys so much for tuning into that conversation. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. There's some ways that you can support this podcast, one of which you can pick up an Align Band, which is a heavy-duty resistance band. It comes along with a door anchor and a carrying case and a video guide on how to mobilize those joints and integrate that body of yours. Really great stuff. You can be found at AlignTherapy.com and also on Amazon.com. Um, thank you also so much for utilizing the Amazon affiliate link on the right hand sidebar of the podcast page bookmark that thing anytime you purchase some crap on amazon purchase that crap through that link we get a percentage of it costs you nothing and i think that's enough thank you guys so much for reviews on itunes thank you for listening thank you for supporting have a beautiful rest of your day Pow.